The geographic expanse of the Roman Empire was extensive, and in order to understand the trend and approach of Rome to seafaring, two fundamental filters merit attention. First, a temporal perspective, which will help us appreciate the changes which occurred to navigation from the foundation of Rome through to the early prince, but all the way up to the division with the east and half, as these changes will be neglected with a more temporal specialized approach. Secondly, we shall look at Rome from its geographical and sociopolitical context, as it was its predecessors, neighbors and rivals that shaped it. The Roman army was the premier fighting force in Europe due to the great ability of its legions, the legionis, to develop, constantly morphing into new deadly systematic bringers of death. Roman equipment and tactics were a direct response to the sort of pressure generated by the enemies of Rome. In a way we could say that it was those who opposed Rome that turned it into the formidable war machina it became. Thanks to the ability of the general, the legatus, to evaluate threat, learn from the enemy, adapt. Roman maritime technology was a response to Greek, Etruscan and Carthaginian seafaring traditions. However, the navy was never completely embraced by the Roman state and deemed somewhat un-Roman. The Roman navy always operated as an adjunct to the Roman army and never as an autonomous body. So how can we understand the maritime culture of the Romans? We first read of Roman maritime activity in the historical record during the Republic in terms of specific battles and treaties. During the imperial period, the Mediterranean became largely a peaceful Roman lake. In the absence of a maritime enemy, the navy was reduced mostly to patrol, anti-piracy and transport duties. The Roman writer Publius Flavius Vegetius Renatus gives us some very interesting information about some very specific kind of vessels and their colour. We read Lest scouting vessels be betrayed by white, the sails and rigging are dyed Venetian blue, which resembles the ocean waves. The wax used to pay ships' sides is also dyed. The sailors and marines put on Venetian blue uniforms too, so as to lie hidden with greater ease when scouting by day as by night. Now this is a very interesting piece of information, so we know that at least some members of the uh, Roman navy did wear blue tunics. Unfortunately, for, as far as the information we have on tunics, and I do have a dedicated video on colours and how they were produced at the times of the Romans, you will find a link in the description below. But one thing we need to keep in mind is that we don't know for sure. We have some educated guests. So in this case, does Vegetius mean that only a very specific kind of vessels were blue and the soldiers were wearing blue? Or does it mean that the majority of soldiers who belonged to the Roman navy were wearing blue uniforms? Well, we don't really know. But we do know that definitely some members of the Roman navy did wear blue uniforms. Submerged cultural resources fill the coastal shelves of the Mediterranean, as shipwrecks were rather common in antiquity. But of course, underwater preservation does present its challenges. Organic tissue simply does not endure the test of time, particularly in the corrosive environment of salt water. Prolonged exposure to aquatic environment breaks down cellular structure in organic material, necessitating of chemical stabilization to allow any hope of preservation. On the other hand, a series of fortuitous conditions might increase the chances of preservation of any given wreck. For instance, if a wreck comes to rest just right on a sandy bottom between large rock clusters, it has a greater chance of being preserved intact. Perhaps the most ideal conditions for preservation occur when wave, tide and surge immediately cover a wreck with a thick layer of sediment deposit, thereby locking it into a protective, anaerobic environment. Now, according to tradition, allegedly, Rome was founded in the 8th century BC. Now, to put this date into perspective, we are talking about almost a thousand years after the boom in maritime transshipping that occurred in Bronze Age Levant. 
This time we put Rome behind the game if we consider the long-standing traditions in the eastern Mediterranean and the highly competitive environment that existed on the sea during the period of Phoenician and Greek colonial expansion. Etruscan and Carthaginian domination of trade and piracy and the emergence of the Thalassocracy in places like Athens. Both the location of Rome, however, and its tradition of abstaining from maritime activity during its early history put Rome in a position to eventually overcome such hurdles. OK, let's start working on our historical map here. Let's start filling in the people. You'll have to excuse my abilities or lack thereof of drawing maps, but you'll have to use a little bit of imagination. So, we are here now, in Sicily. Now, as you can see, I have divided it here, and that is because this part here belonged to the Greeks, whereas this part here, which is where I am now, Palermo and that area, belonged to Carthago, to the Carthaginians. Let's place the other peoples, so we have a more coherent idea on what was going on at the time. Okay, so who do we have on top of Rome? Well, on top of the Romans, here, we have the Etruscans. Now, an easy way to remember them is that what region do we have on top of Lazio here in modern-day Italy? Tuscany. Now, just listen to your voice as you say it. Tuscany, Etruscan, Tuscan. That's exactly where they were from. The name tells us that. Then on top of that, you've got the Celts. Etruscan sea captains were able to establish a successful mercantile empire in the western Mediterranean, but such excellence also made them collide with other lingering powers. The Greeks of southern Italy had a vested interest in maintaining control of sea routes to and from mainland Greece, as well as expanding supply routes into the western Mediterranean. The Etruscan civilization dominated the sea at the time. Much of their economy and social hierarchy was based on maritime activity, and thus, during the period of Etruscan hegemony, the landlocked city of Rome would have been forced to compete with the wealth, power, influence and maritime accomplishments of the Etruscans. But the Etruscans weren't the only competitors. Carthaginians and Greek colonies of southern Italy, Corsica and especially Sicily, were contending with the Etruscans, and all of this resulted in a highly competitive environment in the Tyrrhenian Sea. By waiting several centuries, Rome expanded its land holdings in a manner that gave it greater access to resources, technology and manpower when it did begin to compete for a place on the sea. Moreover, the Roman practice of letting conquered cities become allies and operate with relative autonomy gave Rome further reach with minimal expenditure of its own manpower. In the earliest centuries, the Romans seemed to have had an outright aversion to ship and seafaring. They largely refused to participate in seaborne activities. Then, in the 3rd century, that attitude shifted quickly, if temporarily, to a wholehearted embrace of naval power when it became necessary to defeat the Carthaginians. The generations immediately after the Punic Wars are marked by abandonment of the state's naval pursuits. This in turn created a power vacuum that led to an increased impiety. The Battle of Actium, one of the few major naval battles of the Roman Empire, put an end to the civil war between Antony and Octavian. After Actium, the emperors established a permanent naval force, but its role was reduced to that of an auxiliary force until the empire began to dissolve in the 5th and 6th centuries. This is probably the reason why a city like Rome, which didn't have the resources in competing with the maritime powers of the region, decided to avoid seafaring altogether and focus on land pursuits, which the Romans would come to excel at. Being surrounded by peoples with expertise in seafaring must have made it inadvisable and unproductive for the city of Rome to pursue maritime activity given her disadvantageous position of limited experience. The Romans, however, still managed to gain much knowledge from their predecessors and contemporaries, Etruscan colonial Greeks and the Phoenician Carthaginians. All these civilizations had several hundreds to a thousand years of technical knowledge of ships, navigation, weather and warfare. So how did the Romans lay their hands on this technology? The Romans, as it was their policy, would adopt from the Etruscans, Greeks and Carthaginians 
by either hiring these people to man their ships or by directly copying their boat construction. Language reveals adoption of Greek practices. The Latin term nawis, used generally for boat, is a borrowing from the Greek navs, indicating a borrowing at least on the cultural linguistic level. Rome used the wrecked Carthaginian ship as the model of the fleet. They literally copied the Carthaginian blueprint. This demonstrated there was no technological development of their own in the construction technique and hull dimension, but a wholesale borrowing of pre-existing design. On the other hand, naval superiority and Rome's actual final victory was the main product of tactical innovation. Things started to change for Rome during the 3rd century BC. This is when we see the Romans building and fighting with the navy, in spite of having virtually no prior naval tradition. We mostly remember the diplomatic relations between Rome and Carthage as being hostile, that of sworn enemies. But how was the situation, the diplomatic situation between Rome and Carthage before the First Punic War? Well, at the time Rome was engaged in treaties with Carthage, these early documents reflect the different strategies of these two governing bodies and the seemingly apathetic attitude of Rome towards seafaring. An account by Polybius loosely cited the first treaty and placed it sometime around 509-508 BC. The language of the treaty suggests that Carthage was more concerned about Roman merchants competing in the same ports than about Roman warships attempting to control the same waterways. Roman maritime activity was limited and primarily mercantile. The Roman Empire controlled or had access to all active ports in the Mediterranean. The extensive scope of their territory meant Roman merchant ships could travel farther and towards several distant regions. Also, various kinds of commodities were being imported from locations beyond the Mediterranean Sea Basin, and of course, these would require vessels capable of venturing into the Atlantic and Indian Oceans. At first, what we find is the technique called mortis and tenon, joinery, which was a common and widespread practice of shipbuilding in the Mediterranean, stretching back into the Bronze Age and likely originating in the Levant. Here is how the technique works. You basically insert wooden pegs or tenons into fitted holes, or mortises, that run along the upper and lower edges of each side plank. As a final step, a dole was often inserted transversely. What we find, considering this method, was that each stake was securely affixed to the adjacent planks above and below by several hundred double blocking joints. So while skeleton-based construction is the hallmark of modern naval architecture, shell-based construction was the approach used by many craftsmen up until the 2nd and 3rd centuries Anno Domini. In the classical period, during the height of the Athenian thalassocracy, evidence shows that the mortis and tenon method was still in use. So we can create a sort of a trajectory over time. It is evident that we go from a shell-based to a skeleton-based construction in shipbuilding. Metal nail with time would provide additional internal support and larger ships could be built also because of an increased amount of connection and ribbing to handle rougher weather conditions. Alright number ones, I hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please remember thumbs up and subscribe to my channel for more content from the Metatron. I would like to take a moment to thank my Patreons for their continuous and generous support. It is thanks to you that now I can actually increase the quality of my overall content on the channel. So not only for the Patreon-only productions, such as the documentaries that I publish each month, but also for the rest of the community. Having a budget thanks to Patreon donations allows me to spare more time to prepare better videos with more details and I hope hope more entertaining. Thank you very much for watching and remember, the Metatron has spread his wings. Goodbye.